you like to take test the screen sharing? Uh, okay. Yes, please. Yeah, great. The, is this fine or should yes. I um like to take test screen sharing? I I could go to full screen, I guess. So should we get started or? Uh, not yet. Let, let, let's wait for maybe, usually we wait, wait till uh, 1035. Although I, I know German people are very punctual, but usually people- oh, That's fine. Yeah, so let's wait two or three minutes. And I will introduce you. All right. Maybe we can uh, gradually start. Welcome, everyone. Uh, has this has this common? Sincerely welcome to Harper CMSA seminar. Has this real common to Harper CMSA seminar? Today is our great honor uh, to uh, invite Professor uh, Hans Werner Heimer to speak. As uh, is was eine große Air, Professor Hans Werner Heimer aus uh, Leidener Anschluss. Today, his topic will be nuclear physics. Sein Thema heute ist the chem physics. And Professor uh, Hans Werner Heimer uh, works at the Institute for Chem Physics, TU, 
dumb shot. And uh, uh, although his topic actually is on nuclear physics, uh, to, uh, on the conformal symmetry and uh, in nuclear reactions. And I would like to uh, welcome audience to interrupt and ask questions if you find appropriate. And you, you can also raise your hands. And uh, all right, so uh, Professor Hans van der Hammer, please take over. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction and for the invitation uh, to present this work in your seminar. Um, so I, I want to talk uh, about consequences of conformal symmetry in nuclear reactions, how conformal symmetry can be uh, used to constrain nuclear reactions. But as we'll see, uh, these properties are rather universal and uh, they can in principle uh, also be applied to, uh, to other systems as well. Um, let, let me just stop sharing for a moment. Uh, I have trouble changing the slides. Um, Okay, sorry about this. So this is this is the outline of my talk, um, and the the work I will be presenting uh, is work uh, in collaboration uh, with Dam Son, uh, who I see is also in the audience. Um, and if you want to um, read up more on the details of this work, um, you can take a look at this preprint. So uh, I will start uh, reminding you uh, of. The, the principles of universality and, and the unitary limit and uh, give you um, a brief introduction into uh, Schrodinger symmetry, which is the non-relativistic conformal symmetry. And then I'll put these two uh, things together uh, and discuss consequences uh, for nuclear reactions uh, with neutrons in final states. Uh, and then I'll end with a summary and an outlook. So. Uh, Let me start uh, with universality. Um, you all know universality um, is a concept uh, that relates to physical systems with very short distance behavior, which can exhibit identical behavior at large distances. And the standard example, uh, of course, uh, is in condensed matter physics, condensed matter systems near a critical point uh, show universal behavior and uh, certain observables. Uh, show power law behavior near this critical point. So here uh, is an example of a, a liquid gas uh, critical point and a ferromagnetic one easy axis. Uh, and if you look uh, at the density in one case or at the magnetization in the other case, they show power law behavior with the same critical exponent uh, close to this uh, close to this critical point. And since the systems are in the same universality class, this uh, exponent is the same, despite the fact that the short distance physics of these two systems is very different. At the critical point, uh, this system is scale invariant uh, and, and often uh, it's also conformal invariant. And I will try to apply the same concept now to, to nuclear reactions. And as we'll see, there are also certain observables uh, that, that show power law behavior. So uh, the type of universality that I'll be discussing uh, is universality of the unitary limit. So let me briefly introduce uh, what the unitary limit is. So um, consider uh, a system 
that has resonant uh, short range S wave interactions. And then the unitary limit is an ideal limit uh, for the description of such a system where you take the scattering length to infinity. So you take uh, the maximum strength of the interactions. And at the same time, you take the range uh, of the interactions, uh, typical low energy scale here to zero. So you can, in principle, achieve this limit uh, theoretically if you want, if you consider some, uh, some potential here and uh, at the same time adjust the range of this potential and the depth in such a way that the range goes to zero uh, and uh, this shallow bound state here ends up directly at threshold. Of course, this is a, a, a theoretical limit. This uh, cannot be reached in real physical systems because uh, you can't really have zero range interactions, but it turns out uh, this is a very useful uh, limit to expand around uh, in order to uh, describe uh, systems of, of fermions with strong interactions. The name comes from the fact that if you look at the scattering amplitude for two particles, so this is non relativistic particles, so this can always be uh, written as one over k cotangent delta minus i k, where k is the relative momentum of the particles and delta is the scattering phase shift. And uh, for small k and short range potentials, this is analytic uh, in k squared. And the leading term is determined by the scattering length. The next term is the effective range. And then you have some higher order terms. And in the unitary limit, um, the scattering length uh, is um, driven towards infinity. All the other terms here are zero. So as a consequence, the scattering amplitude um, is just I over K and it is scale invariant. There is no dimension full parameter in there anymore. And uh, in fact, this is the maximum scattering that is allowed by unitarity. So this is where this limit comes from. Um, now, as you might know, there is a, a lot of uh, interesting physics in this limit. So uh, it uh, determines the physics of BEC, BCS crossover. Um, and uh, there are many systems in nature that are close to this limit. So um, for example, uh, you, you can think of, of neutrons as we'll see in the following, they're uh, very close to the unitary limit, but you can also engineer systems close to the unitary limit with ultra cold atoms uh, using Feshbach resonances. Uh, connected to this is this uh, whole uh, topic of the universal the viscosity bound and the perfect lim uh, liquid, which is discussed in the context of the, the strongly interacting quark gluon plasma. Uh, and it, it turns out that uh, cold atom systems close to, unit, to this unitary limit uh, almost saturate um, this uh, universal bound. What I'm interested in this talk is a little bit different. Uh, I'll, essentially discuss the few body physics of the unitary limit. Uh, and so what I will um, use is that the system also has a non-relativistic conformal symmetry. So uh, this was uh, you know, realized um, in this paper by me and Stuart and Wise. And if you, uh, want uh, to get all the details on the conformal symmetry of the system, there is a nice paper by Nishida and Son, which uh, summarizes all of the important uh, facts about this and you know, derived uh, many new, new properties. And the, the, the point uh, uh, I'm using is that uh, multi-neutron systems are actually approximately conformal. Uh, if one looks at energies that are both large compared to the energy scale set by the scattering length. So this is relatively small, this energy scale for neutrons because they have a large scattering length, 0.1 MeV. But yet on the other hand, the energy has to be small uh, compared to the energy scale set by the effective range, which is of the order of five MeV. Uh, for energies in this range, there is an approximate uh, conformal symmetry, and this is what uh, I want to exploit uh, for nuclear reactions. 
Excuse so, me. Yes. Can I ask a question on the Please. previous slide. So just make sure. So is the dimensionality of the system uh, relevant for the discussion about the unitarity limit you discuss, you, you you mentioned here? For example, um, you know, three dimensional space. Yes, what? we are we are in three dimensional space here. So okay. and. It, and all, everything I'll be discussing uh, here will will in, will be in three dimensions. And will will there still some 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 uh, lesson we can learn from maybe uh, two plus one dimensional space time or other even other dimensional space time based on the assumption you have for the S wave interaction? Maybe maybe a lot of things still carry out because um, maybe the analysis here is more like the radial direction and maybe dimensionality. Uh, I don't know whether it affects the the uh, discussion, or, or, or maybe it's not a, it's not a topic. Um, no, I think it definitely uh, it definitely um, uh, affects the discussion. And it, you know, you're talking about the unitary limit. Uh, what that is, it depends on on what, what uh, kind of space time uh, dimensions uh, you're uh, you're considering. Uh, and uh, in, in the, the, the systems behave very differently if you go to lower and higher dimensions. Uh, okay. So here um, I, I'm, I'm really focused on, on the case uh, on the case of three dimensions, um, since this is where, where neutrons live. Thank you. So. Um, now, in the title, I had this word uh, uh, unnuclear physics. So this uh, is kind of derived from this unparticle concept that, that was uh, introduced by, by Georgi um, as a um, possible uh, scenario for physics beyond the standard model. So uh, Georgi's unparticle is just a field in, in a relativistic conformal field theory. Uh, and there, no, the assumption is that there is a hidden conformal symmetry sector beyond the standard model, which is weakly coupled. Uh, and if you uh, uh, observe reactions with standard model particles indirectly, uh, you can see this conformal symmetry by uh, uh, looking at energy distributions of the standard model particles and recoil distributions and so on. Um, people have looked at this uh, scenario at the LHC, but so far, uh, this has not been seen. Now, this uh, Georgi scenario, of course, um, applies uh, to a, a field theory that has a relativistic conformal symmetry. Now, we took this uh, as a motivation to look at the, the non-relativistic analog. Um, and uh, it turns out uh, in nuclear physics, this non-relativistic analog is actually realized. So it's the non-relativistic analog of this uh, unparticle idea of Georgi, although it's not a, it's not a hidden uh, sector there. I mean, the, the neutrons, of course, uh, can be measured and they, they appear in the real world. Um, and uh, not the unnucleus is uh, no, in analogy to this uh, concept up here, just a field in a non-relativistic conformal field theory. Uh, and in this case, uh, the field doesn't have to be massless. So it's characterized by a mass uh, and a scaling dimension. And uh, in the free field case, the scaling dimension is just the standard mass dimension that you have for um, a non-relativistic field theory. And you can show that this is the, the lowest possible value. So this is a lower bound from unitarity. And uh, all interacting fields um, have a delta that is larger or equal to three halves. Uh, but uh, may I ask you, uh, when you are talking about conformal symmetry, it, it's a different conformal uh, group than say, uh, than say an relativistic one, right? Yes, so, yes, yes. So, uh, so you probably will tell more about this or? I, I, will, I will tell a little more about it, yes. And um, then, so if, if you're not satisfied, um, you can ask. Uh, you can ask again. Mm -hmm. So here it is. Um, 
the, this non-relativistic conformal symmetry is also called uh, a Schrodinger symmetry, since it's a symmetry group of the free, free Schrodinger equation. And now it, it includes the, the symmetry transformations uh, of the Galilei group. So this is space and time translations, and, uh, rotations and Galilei boosts. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, there are scale transformations. So they're, they're shown here. Uh, and uh, special conformal transformations. So this has uh, 12 parameters and the generators of these uh, symmetry transformations, uh, of course, are the, the Hamiltonian, the total momentum, angular momentum, uh, the generator of the Galilei boosts, and then uh, the generators, uh, this is for the dilatations uh, and the, the special conformal transformations. And they, they satisfy the Schrodinger algebra. So it's it's a it's a different group from this non-relativistic uh, from the relativistic conformal symmetry. It's the non-relativistic analog. But but is it uh, just uh, if you start from relativistic one, uh, can you get this as a certain limit or you know because normally you would think that uh, you can go uh, you know to non-relativistic uh, limit in some way. But I'm not sure whether here it, it's in the different group or one could be taken as a limit of the other. Um, so I'm, I'm not an, uh, an, an expert in this, but I would assume that you can get this uh, also uh, as, as a limit of the relativistic conformal symmetry because it's the, um, the, the, it's the symmetry group of, of the Schrodinger equation of the free Schrodinger equation. And you can get the Schrodinger equation in a non-relativistic limit uh, from um, relativistic wave equations. But uh, maybe uh, I see Damson unmuted. Yeah. Do you want to add something? No, I think, I think it's not, it's, hard, it's at least I don't know how to do it the way usually it is done, that is to take the um, non-relativistic limits because there is a mass here that breaks um, conformal symmetry. So the short answer is that it wouldn't come out. Yeah, so on, but I'm asking exactly for this reason, because it doesn't look that trivial, right? Uh, that uh, because you have this uh, new parameter, right? And it's uh, in this way, it's kind of, uh, I mean, not directly connected to relativistic uh, conformal symmetry, right? Yeah, I can tell you one way to do that. Take the non, the relativistic um, group and restrict it to a transformation that preserve one light cone coordinate, then if one would get the Schrodinger. Ah, but it's it's like a uh, uh, light light plant uh, uh, yeah. formulation, right? You mean this way? Yeah. Ah, I see. So in light plant, you can uh, connect uh, non relativistic and relativistic. It's what you are saying. Yes. I see. Thank you. Okay. So then um, the, the next step uh, is to look at this uh, system of unitary fermions. Um, and here, just a, a brief summary uh, of, of how this system could be described in, in an effective field theory. So uh, for these non-relativistic fermions, uh, if you write down an effective Lagrangian, uh, this system is described course, by the, the, free, um, the free Lagrangian that would give you the free Schrodinger equation. And then uh, you have a four fermion contact interaction uh, with the coupling constant G2. And uh, this is all that, um, that is allowed. Uh, and um, since we have uh, strong interactions, a large scattering length, um, you, you have to solve this theory exactly. And it's so simple that uh, the exact solution, or it's a non-relativistic theory is just given by summing up all these bubbles. Uh, and since it's a contact interaction. Uh, these bubbles are all independent of each other. So there is no uh, crosstalk between one bubble to the other. So this just reduces to um, a geometric series and you have to calculate this one loop diagram which has a, a linear divergence that you have to renormalize. And um, 
So if you do this and derive the renormalization group equation for this coupling constant, so G2 tilde is a dimensionless version of this coupling constant that has a, a power of the cutoff absorbed to make it uh, dim dimensionless, then you get uh, equation of this type. And you see uh, this, this has two fixed points. There is the free fixed point. So this uh, coupling stops to run when the coupling is zero. So this is the limit of no interaction. In this case, the scattering length is zero, but there is also a non-trivial fixed point, namely uh, when G2 tilde is equal to minus one. And this exactly corresponds to the case one over A is equal to zero, which of course is the, the unitary limit. Uh, and uh, in, it was shown that um, the, in this unitary limit, there, uh, the theory has uh, this full conformal Schrodinger symmetry. And as I already uh, said before, neutrons uh, are not exactly in the unitary limit. So here are the, the, the relevant numbers. The scattering length is of the order of minus 20 Fermi, uh, the effective range uh, 10 times smaller. But there is an interval where you can uh, neglect uh, both of these dimensions full numbers. And in this region, uh, the neutrons are approximately conformal. Um, sorry, can I ask a question? Uh, please. Um, so is it possible to just briefly describe how the conformal symmetry, non relativistic conformal symmetry arises from the unitary limit? Um, So, I mean, this, this was shown, uh, shown in, in this paper, right? So there is um, the, 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 formal, the formal proof of that. They, they just show that uh, this theory um, satisfies the, the conformal ward identities. And on a more, um, let's say, uh, heuristic level, uh, I mean, the, the, it's, it's not uh, too far fetched to assume that there you have this uh, conformal symmetry because uh, there is no scale left in the theory anymore, right? Uh, the, the, scattering, uh, the scattering length uh, is infinite. So this, this scale goes away um, and uh, you can remove the cutoff. So there isn't apart from this non relativistic mass, which always enters. Uh, not with a factor of one over M, uh, th there is no scale in this theory anymore. So th this, uh, I think it's clear that it's scale invariant. And then uh, the question is, is it also uh, a conformally invariant? And uh, this you can show explicitly by uh, uh, looking at the, the word identities um, for, for the Green's functions in that theory. Thank you. But uh, also to ask, uh, it is particular Newton Newton uh, channel, right? You consider no, nothing else. Uh, yes. So I, I I will consider the neutron neutron channel, and uh, so I, I assume you are um, driving towards this issue of of the FMOF effect. Um, when so if you uh, if you do this uh, for bosons, for example, if you had identical bosons, um, then uh, in the two-body system, you have this uh, conformal symmetry. Uh, but if you add a third particle, you find that this symmetry is actually anomalous and, and that it's, uh, it's broken to a, uh, to a discrete subgroup of the scale transformations. Uh, but, but say, for example, just uh, say a Newton proton scattering is not included in this cells, right? Like, uh, you know, uh, 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 because there it's also have, you have neutron, you know, I mean, it's also kind of interesting case, right? But, but uh, it's not applicable there. Or... Exactly. Because this, uh, if you, if you um, include neutrons and protons, um, then uh, it, it depends a little bit on, on what kind of partial wave channel you're looking at. So there are, yeah. there are certain channels where it's very similar to the neutrons. So for example, if you have 
uh, deuteron and a neutron uh, in, a, in a quartet spin channel. That is very similar to what I'm discussing here. I see. But if you're looking in a duplet channel, and this is exactly where the Ethimov effect occurs, uh, then in the three body system, uh, the symmetry is broken. I see. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think that the simple rule is, is always uh, if you are in a channel where you have the Ethimov effect, then this is not applicable anymore. But mm -hmm. for neutrons, it is. And uh, in the end, uh, in, in, my, um, in my outlook, I'll discuss a little bit um, what, what happens uh, if, you, if you go to this other case, which, of course, is also interesting. Oh, I, I have a question. And Liu Jun have, you know, has another question after. I think my question maybe is more for uh, Dantian Sun about the, this interpretation of uh, this uh, Schrodinger non-relativistic conformal symmetry. Uh, as, as you say that there's some uh, choice for Lycon coordinates and maybe co x plus x minus and I think uh, in the procedure there you do compatify one of the Lycon direction to give us some Kaluza uh, Klein modes and that modes can have some discrete spectrums associated with number I was just wondering say whether this follow the question of Akadi whether this procedure has a physical interpretation other than just mathematical Treatment. I wonder you have a comment about that. Um, that that's, that's some question follow up with you. Um, yeah, this 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 I don't know. Um, uh, may, maybe Son has something uh, to add on this. It looks like mathemat a mathematical procedure. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. And Liu Jun has a question. Mm, I just want to ask this. You interacting fixed point is repulsive, right? Um, yes, so it depends on from which direction you are coming. Um, but I, 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 I don't remember that now. Um, Does it depend on from which direction you are coming? Um, well, whether you're coming from the ultraviolet or the infrared. Oh, I, I go to the infrared. You go to the infrared. Um, and this is an unstable fixed point. I think it is an unstable fixed point, yes. But I'm, I'm not, um, so I, I um, should know this. But I... Um, I don't remember that now. I have to look that up. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, so uh, then so, since we established that in the unitary limit, uh, the system can be described by a field theory with conformal symmetry. Now we can uh, use the constraints that this conformal symmetry, the non-relativistic conformal symmetry uh, provides for the Green's functions. And uh, for the two-point function, for example, uh, you can show that it uh, must have this form. The parameters that appear here uh, are was the mass of this non-relativistic field uh, and the scaling dimension. Uh, and it's the symmetry determines this Green's function um, up to an overall constant. And if you Fourier transform uh, to momentum space, uh, you have the corresponding Green's function in momentum space, and then uh, you get this form. And uh, you see that uh, if delta, the scaling dimension is three halves, which is the value for a free field, uh, this has a pole, but uh, for any other value of delta, uh, it has a branch cut. Uh, and because of this, um, this general unnucleus, um, then of course doesn't behave uh, like a standard particle uh, since the Green's function uh, only has this cut. And this is uh, kind of the property that we will be able to see hopefully experimentally. Uh, the imaginary part of this propagator is given here. So again, there's the, the delta function if you have this pole and, uh, 
and uh, you have the, the, the branch cut here. And if you want to be a little bit more concrete, uh, what could be such a uh, non relativistic unparticle or an unnucleus? Of course, you can just take a free field, um, and it just this non relativistic field psi, which the mass is the mass of the field, delta is three halves. You could take n free fields, then you have just a collection of n free fields. The mass is n times the mass of this field. And of course, the scaling dimension is just uh, n times three halves. But the, the, the interesting case that we will uh, come to is the case of n interacting fields, um, where uh, the mass is still n times the mass of the individual field, but the scaling dimension will be different. And uh, in our case, this unnucleus is a strongly interacting multi-neutron state. So these are neutron fields then uh, with energies uh, in this energy range where uh, conformal symmetry um, is a, a approximate, an approximate symmetry of the system. So how can you calculate the scaling dimension? Um, now you, of course, can calculate that from, from a field theory calculation, but uh, you can also uh, obtain it uh, for neutrons uh, in, in any other case, if you want, uh, in, in a very, uh, very simple way uh, from operator state correspondence. So uh, the scaling dimension of a primary operator uh, you can uh, calculate by just calculate the energy uh, of the state this operator uh, corresponds to in a harmonic oscillator uh, in units of h bar omega. Um, and again, um, many more details on this you can find in this uh, paper by, by Nishida and so on. So the simplest interacting case that you can look at is uh, two neutrons. Uh, and so one and two refer uh, to spin up and spin down. So um, since uh, you have the Pauli principle, the you know, neutrons with the same spin don't interact. So you have to have one, uh, not in an S wave at least. So you have to have one neutron with spin up and spin down, psi one, psi two, and the scaling dimension here is two. Uh, in the three, uh, if you have three neutrons, uh, then of course two uh, of them have to have the same spin. Uh, so if you want to have a, a contact operator like that, you, you have to uh, include derivatives. Uh, and here uh, is an operator uh, that has um, orbital angular momentum, uh, orbital angular momentum L equal one. The scaling dimension is 4.27. Uh, and uh, if you have, um, an S wave, uh, then you need another derivative and the scaling dimension is, is 4.6. And all these numbers here, so uh, up to N equal three, uh, you can calculate them uh, also from uh, field theory methods by solving transcendental equations. So you can calculate them to arbitrary precision if you want, but for more and four part, uh, four and more particles, uh, you really um, have to calculate uh, the, the energy of the corresponding state in a harmonic oscillator, which is uh, typically done numerically. And you see the precision here uh, is not as high. And here are the, the lowest operators uh, for two, three, four, and five particles in the corresponding scaling dimensions. Uh, so you already see that there, there's, this uh, establishes an, an interesting connection between this uh, system of neutrons, this uh, nuclear physics system uh, and unitary fermions in, in a harmonic trap. So th there you already see the universality at work. Now, the application uh, I want to discuss um, is a high energy nuclear reaction with final state neutrons. So uh, assume you have two uh, particles coming in and let's assume they are non-relativistic. Um, doesn't have to be the case uh, since 
we only need uh, this particle, uh, this unparticle to be non-relativistic, but um, for nuclear reactions, typically this is a good uh, assumption. And the kinetic energy that is available to this unnucleus and this recoil particle B is given by the mass difference um, between these particles and the kinetic energy of the incoming particles. And uh, in the final state, of course, this splits up in the energy of this recoil particle B uh, and the energy of this unnucleus U. Uh, and as I said, we will consider this unnucleus to be a multi neutron state uh, so uh, that we can uh, apply this conformal symmetry. Now, we will assume that this. Uh, is not a general reaction, but it's a reaction where the energy scale of this primary reaction, so this is the reaction of this uh, primary vertex, is much larger uh, than the energy uh, of the neutrons in their center of mass. So U uh, is the total energy of this uh, unnucleus, which is the multi neutron state. And here, uh, if you subtract, um, the center of mass energy uh, of this multi neutron system from U, and uh, then you get the energy of those in the center of mass, uh, and this should be small. Uh, the, of course, um, this conformal symmetry uh, would always apply uh, when you have um, the neutrons in with energies in this. Uh, energy range where you have the approximate uh, conformal symmetry. Uh, and it turns out this, uh, you're exactly in this range uh, if this uh, recoil particle is close to its maximum energy. Because we have this separation of scales, the cross section uh, for this process factorizes. So, and it factorizes in the um, matrix element of this primary reaction times the imaginary part of this uh, of the propagator of this uh, unnucleus. And uh, so it, it's easy to show with this formula if you, um, let's say, assume since this is a, a high energy reaction, it's, a, it's a, a local reaction. So you can, in principle, you can uh, describe uh, this matrix element in an effective field theory just by a uh, by a, a coupling constant, by a local interaction. So you would couple these two fields uh, um, in, in your effective Lagrangian to those two. Uh, and then you can write down, uh, write down the cross section here. Um, and when you use the, the optical theorem for, um, for this unnucleus propagator, uh, then uh, you see that uh, in the matrix element squared, you just get this imaginary part GU. And uh, as we saw before, this imaginary part is very strongly constrained by the conformal symmetry. Uh, so th this is uh, where um, we will get our predictions from. Uh, in fact, uh, this reproduces this uh, well-known watson migdal treatment for the final state interaction of two particles. So if you only have two neutrons here, then it's exactly this watson migdal case. And uh, we generalize this here um, to um, multi-neutron systems with an arbitrary number of neutrons. So if you wanted to detect this, uh, detect this now in an experiment. There are two ways to do this. So um, you can uh, either measure this recoil particle B. Uh, this is uh, how that was done in the past because uh, it's difficult to detect the neutrons. They're, uh, they're uncharged and um, they're easily missed in detectors because of that. Um, but nowadays, there are also very powerful neutron detectors. So you can actually also measure the neutrons directly. So uh, this gives you these two ways. Uh, if you detect the recoil particle uh, and uh, take into account the formula from the previous transparency, uh, you assume that the energy dependence of 
this primary reaction matrix element is very small uh, in the energy region of relevance. No, this, this is a um, reasonable assumption because we assume it's a high energy reaction that is effectively local. Then uh, this differential cross section uh, behaves like E0 minus EV. So this is the maximum recoil energy of this uh, E particle uh, minus the actual energy. And the power is determined by the scaling dimension of this unnucleus minus five halves. That's one way of doing it. Uh, the other way of doing it is that you detect all final state particles, including the neutrons. Uh, and then you can look at the differential cross section as a function of the neutron energy. Uh, and then the neutron energy in their center of mass. So this is exactly the uh, energy I talked about before where uh, you um, subtract the center of mass motion uh, of the neutrons. Uh, again, determined by the same scaling dimension. Now, th there have been a number of experiments around in the past uh, when people looked for um, bound states of neutrons. So one um, uh, question that, that was uh, discussed in, in the 70s is whether di-neutrons actually exist, whether two neutrons are bound. Uh, they're very close to being bound, but they're not exactly uh, bound. And then uh, there was discussion on whether there would be a bound state uh, of three neutrons. Uh, and this is one of the experiments looking for that. Uh, so this was radiative pion capture on Triton. Um, and the final state had three neutrons and they have um, just uh, these energy distributions uh, that are predicted by conformal symmetry. But it turns out if you take the data from these old experiments, they're consistent with this prediction, uh, but um, you cannot really extract the exponent because the, the data are not precise enough. Now, nowadays, uh, people are looking uh, whether there are resonances of low energy resonances of neutrons. And there is one recent experiment which was done uh, at Riken in Japan uh, in this reaction where um, a helium-8 beam uh, is shot on an alpha particle target. And then uh, they measure beryllium-8 and, and four neutrons. Uh, and this experiment actually um, has some evidence of the existence of a tetra-neutron resonance, but it's not uh, very convincing and they have uh, very few events. So uh, again, uh, we cannot test uh, our prediction uh, on the real data here. So uh, in the absence of real data, um, what we did um, is to uh, look at this uh, approximately conformal behavior at unnucleus behavior in uh, in realistic calculations and um, of such nuclear reactions. So uh, the first example uh, is you just look at the, at the two-body system. So this is a reaction uh, where um, hit a helium-6 beam uh, on a proton, uh, the alpha knockout reaction, and you have two neutrons in the final state. And um, so there is, uh, on calculation in what is called a halo EFT. And the, the calculation uh, is actually the red and green points in here. Uh, the green points are, is a calculation of this reaction where the final state interaction is, neglect, is neglected. So the whole uh, energy distribution, so this is the energy distribution of the neutrons uh, without final state interaction is the green points. And you see um, the, the dashed line is the prediction uh, of the, the framework that, that I just discussed. If you assume that the scaling dimension is the scaling dimension of three particles. So that um, is delta for two neutrons is just three, two times three halves. And you see uh, here at low energies, um, this describes uh, this calculation very well. At higher energies, then of course, 
where you see the effects of the helium six wave function. So um, there is uh, this is an um, it's an extended um, extended nucleus, uh, and these effects you see in here. So at some point it doesn't work anymore. If you include the final state interaction, you know, that would be the description of, of the real world. You get the, the red points. And you see there is some peak um, and very low energies. Uh, so here, um, this is the physics that is determined by the actual value of the scattering length. So this is not conformal, but uh, once you go beyond the 0.1 MeV, so this is where approximately this peak is, you see that uh, the, the conformal prediction um, is this blue line uh, fits the calculation extremely well. In this case, uh, actually, um, you can also describe the whole curve because uh, you can just calculate the, the propagator for finite scattering length. Um, this is what is called the dimer propagator. And it has this form. So in the unitary limit, of course, this would uh, go away and you just have one over square root of E. So this is this region here. Uh, but if you take the full propagator uh, of this dimer field, you can also describe this peak at low energy. And if you take a, a, different, uh, a different calculation, this, this phase model, which is a model that many nuclear physicists use for, for nuclear reactions, uh, you again see uh, the same conclusion. Okay, so this was for two neutrons. Now, um, excuse me, yeah. sorry, uh, yes? maybe I think this two figures earlier, the, the slide earlier. Uh, can you say again, what are we trying to compare on the left-hand side on this hello EFT and the right-hand side FAC? Are they oh, having the same, so, similar results? Yes, so it's, um, so we, we have this uh, prediction for this, uh, the, so this is the energy distribution of the neutrons in this reaction in a certain energy region, right? So here we are in the conformal region. And as I said, since we don't have uh, sufficiently precise experimental data at the moment, we just compare uh, two reaction calculations uh, of these reactions with the you know, sophisticated nuclear physics models. Uh, but of course, there is more, more than one model around and they differ in the details. And for certain um, observables, they, they also give you different results, of course. Uh, but if they have the correct physics included, uh, I mean, they, they should, in the appropriate energy region, they should satisfy this approximate conformal symmetry also. Uh, so, and this is what you see here. So um, the dots are the calculations uh, in these two uh, different models, if you want, um, which have different short distance physics and different assumptions about the dynamics at short distances, but uh, they both uh, are in agreement with this universal prediction that comes from conformal symmetry. So that, that is what you should take away here. And since you get it in, uh, in two different models, uh, this um, gives you also some confidence um, in, in the universality of this. And it probably means uh, what's, what's rho? Is that related to the scattering sigma or something? Rho, rho is the energy distribution. So this is, um, you're in the experiment, you, you are measuring uh, the two neutrons. And then um, you're, you're, you're measuring the probability distribution um, to find uh, the neutrons uh, at a specific relative energy. So it's an experimental observable. And um, because of the, the properties of the reactions of the neutrons, right, there is some peak. So it's more like, you're more likely to see uh, in the experiment neutrons uh, with a, a small energy of order 0.1 MeV than neutrons uh, with an energy of 2 MeV. So in that experiment, you would shoot, uh, you do this reaction and uh, 
run your accelerator and then you, you measure this neutron distributions by just collecting uh, different events and then uh, you make a histogram. Okay, and is there some parameter ready to uh, maybe a radial direction, how far away you are from the center of the, the nucleus or something? Is when you cut your density, how is the density measured in respect to where? It, it's a probability density. So you, um, I mean, this is um, so the neutrons are measured far away from the reaction point. So um, there, there are there are free particles and they are outside of the interaction region. I see. No problem. I get it. Thank you. Okay. So a, a little bit less trivial example is to look at the three-body system. Uh, and there, there are calculations uh, of this energy distribution, um, the differential decay width uh, of um, the radiative muon capture on the triton and radiative pion capture on the triton. So these are uh, similar, uh, similar reactions. Now this is an, um, so this is the pion capture and this is the muon capture. Um, and again, uh, there are, so we are at very low energy uh, of the neutrons. Now this is the energy of three neutrons here and here. Um, and uh, we are again looking at the spectrum and uh, there are calculations uh, again for the case where the final state interaction of these neutrons is not included. So in the, of course, this is not the real world, but in the calculation, it's just assumed that the three neutrons, once they're produced, they just fly out. Um, uh, and then there is the second calculation, which is more realistic, where um, the final state interaction of these neutrons is included. So these are these upper points. And again, um, since these are qualitatively uh, very similar, uh, let's look at the lower points. This is the reaction without final state interaction. Uh, so this is again at low energies described by the curve that you get from the assumption um, of free neutrons, the scaling dimension for free neutrons uh, is just three. So this is the corresponding behavior for the free neutrons. So this the, the unnucleus co corresponding to free particles, but uh, in the real world, now we have this uh, fractional scaling dimensions that uh, we have in the three body system and we see that uh, once the interactions are included, now this is what would correspond to the real world. The free solution here uh, only works at extremely low energies, can maybe describe the first point here, but the other low energy points are described um, by uh, including the, the scaling dimension of um, this three neutron state. Uh, in the P wave. So that is the one with the lowest scaling dimension. And if you include the next term, uh, which has a little bit higher scaling dimension, uh, you can improve this a little bit, but uh, not really significantly. So that's the difference between the blue and this red dash dotted line. But again, the conclusion is that uh, in no, this, uh, nuclear model calculation that takes some interaction. So it's this AV18 interaction and certain uh, 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 free body force that is included, which um, well, describes uh, many properties in nuclear physics very well. Um, again, here you see the traces uh, from, from conformal symmetry. And the way the behavior is obtained here, so Remember the formula that we had before. So this um, energy distribution should behave as delta as the scaling dimension minus five halves. Now the lowest uh, scaling dimension uh, is 4.27 and so on. Minus five halves, we get the 1.77. And this is what we see here in the plot. In this other reaction, 
Uh, so here, the, it's for um, for muon capture. Here we have pion capture. Pion is a little bit heavier than the muon, so the energy scale of this reaction is a little bit larger. Um, so the approximation that we made should work a little bit better, and this is also what you see here on the curves. But otherwise, we see the same qualitative behavior that in this uh, intermediate energy region. Uh, you see uh, this conformal behavior. So that essentially tells you that these calculations have the right physics. Now, uh, of course, it would be interesting to see this uh, in a real experiment. Um, and there are uh, experiments uh, ongoing where uh, this is within reach. So uh, they, are, they are done at Recon. Now, Recon, they, uh, they have a, a rare isotope beam facility. They can uh, create beams of uh, these nuclei in the reactions that we considered here. Uh, and there is one uh, for this helium-6 reaction that I discussed before. Uh, this is actually intended to measure the neutron-neutron scattering length. Uh, but uh, as a side product, they can also look for this unnucleus behavior. And the prediction would be uh, that this uh, energy distribution of the neutrons uh, in this energy region has this particular behavior. It should fall off like the energy uh, to the power minus one half. And um, there are no experiments uh, at the moment for three neutron resonances, but there is a new experiment for four neutron resonance. Uh, and this uh, actually has been carried out, this uh, experiment. It's currently being analyzed. And here the prediction uh, is that this would behave with a fractional power and the prediction is 2.57, again, in this energy region. And uh, would be interesting um, to see uh, the results of these experiments. They, they should come out uh, for this uh, lower one, um, probably in the next two years. And it uh, would be really interesting to see this prediction confirmed uh, because it connects the, the properties of neutrons to the properties of unitary fermions and the properties of ultra cold atoms. So uh, let me summarize here. Uh, so I talked about one flavor of uh, universality in the unitary limit, which is related to this approximate uh, conformal symmetry. Uh, and the particular prediction that I discussed is the, the power law behavior uh, of observables, which is determined by uh, the scaling dimension uh, of the fields uh, in the conformal field theory. Uh, I discussed applications to high energy nuclear reactions with neutrons. So we discussed a few examples. Um, apart from what I discussed, this is also um, interesting because these nuclear reactions are very difficult to calculate, um, very difficult to, uh, to treat the structure and the reaction uh, calculation at the same level. Um, and this gives model independent constraints for these reaction calculations, uh, which uh, are a, a very useful check on the calculation. Of course, we have the connection between reactions and the properties of uh, trapped particles. Now, um, in the outlook, uh, at other applications and extensions, um, of course, uh, we started with uh, ultra cold uh, fermions. Uh, we could go back to this. So, um, uh, if one uh, could do similar reactions with ultra cold fermions, of course, the same uh, would apply. Um, it turns out that you can uh, observe uh, similar physics in systems of neutral charm mesons. Uh, so, we recently put out a, a preprint on this. And if, if you're interested in that, uh, I, I can show a few transparencies in the discussion. Um, now, 
uh, these systems of charm mesons, uh, even though these charm mesons are bosons, uh, it turns out they're actually behaving very similar uh, to fermions because uh, they're, they're, they're below the critical coupling for the FMOF effect. And as I said in the beginning already, uh, in systems or channels where you have the FMOF effect, all this doesn't apply because uh, only uh, in the two body system, you have this conformal symmetry. And if you have three and more particles, the conformal symmetry is broken. Uh, and this uh, actually um, shows itself um, by the fact that when you calculate the scaling dimensions, these deltas, they, they will become complex. Uh, and this is what, uh, what leads to this uh, limit cycle behavior and, uh, and the FMOF effect. So uh, what I talked about here in this talk doesn't apply, uh, but maybe there is some, uh, some other interesting physics uh, that one uh, can get out of these complex scaling dimensions and of the discrete scale symmetry that remains. Okay, so that, that's uh, all I wanted to say. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hans Werner Hammer, for the wonderful lecture seminars. Uh, I suppose there could be additional slides. He may want to share after some of the questions asked from the, well, by the audience. But the uh, uh, question from the audience first, please. Can I ask a question? Please. Uh, so you emphasized the uh, um, uh, you are talking about a two fermion system. Um, but no, here more. I talked about more than two. I, I just said that in certain systems, uh, if you have more than, so for neutrons, you have conformal symmetry for an arbitrary number of neutrons. But if you would go to uh, other systems, and you know, these are these systems where you have the FMOF effect, then the conformal symmetry is broken if you have more than two. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to understand this better. How, what's the relation between the breaking of conformal symmetry and the number of fermions? Um, so one way of thinking about this um, is uh, the, the, the way that uh, is original to FMOF. Uh, if, you, if you look at so in, in, if you just have two particles, then everything is fine. So what, what happens if you add another particle? In these systems, uh, so if you look at few body systems, one useful set of coordinates is to look at hyperspherical coordinates. Hyperspherical coordinates is just a generalization of standard spherical coordinates. So let's say if you have three particles, uh, then... Um, you have one so-called hyper radius, uh, and then you have five angles. So you take one dimension full coordinate and the rest are angles. So if you take out the center of mass, you would have uh, six coordinates and these six coordinates, you take one radius and five angles uh, instead of uh, the six components of the, the, the Jacobi coordinates if you want. And it turns out that um, it's, uh, it's useful to take this coordinates because if you look at the short distance properties of such a system, that only depends on the hyper radius. So the angles drop out. And what you find is that um, in the three body system and also in higher body systems that in this hyper radius, you get a one dimensional Schrodinger equation with a one over R squared potential. And, uh, you might know that the, the one over R squared potential is a singular potential. Uh, and if you are attractive enough, uh, this potential does not have a unique solution, even in, in, in quantum mechanics. So you need to renormalize this. And, and you can renormalize this, for example, by introducing a boundary condition at short distances or a three body force, uh, however you want to do this, or some self adjoint extension of this potential would be a different way of thinking about this. And it turns out that, um, so there is a critical coupling. If the one over R squared potential is repulsive, then everything is fine. 
And if it's attractive below a critical coupling constant, also everything is fine. But once the coupling, so the, the, just the coupling constant in the numerator of this one over R squared potential, once this goes beyond the critical value, which is uh, minus a quarter or so, uh, then uh, all of a sudden, this is not self-adjoint anymore and you don't have a unique solution, but you get the FMOV effect. And what the, the coupling constant of this potential is, that, uh, that depends on what type of system and what type of channel you're looking at. So for, for the neutrons, uh, you're below the critical value, but if you would go to uh, identical bosons, you're above and you have the FMOV effect. So that, that's one way of explaining that. Did that make it clear? But, uh, thanks, but how is it related to conformal symmetry breaking? Um, well, if you have, um, you can think about this. Um, if, if you're above the critical coupling, you have this fall to the center phenomenon. So the system just collapses. And in order to stop the collapse, as I said, you, you have to renormalize this. So you need some kind of three body force uh, or a boundary condition. And this boundary condition introduces a scale into the problem. So even though you're in the unitary limit where all the scales are gone, uh, you, you need this, this, this symmetry is anomalous and you, you need to regularize it and you need to introduce a scale, a physical scale. And then uh, of course, conformal symmetry is broken because once you have a scale in that problem, it's not scale invariant anymore. And if it's not scale invariant, it's also not conformal. I see, thanks. Uh, maybe uh, one related question is, when you say in some cases, any number of fermions is fine, do you mean even a finite density of fermions is also fine? Yes. Um, you mean you have a Fermi surface? Um, I mean, there is, um, if, if you, there, in the unitary Fermi gas, um, yeah, the, the density uh, the density provides another scale, uh, but um, uh, or the Fermi energy. Uh, but for example, if you if you calculate um, if you look at the system like that, uh, then um, the the energy of the system is just a pure number uh, times times the Fermi energy. Meaning and, there's still conformal symmetry. Um, I mean, there is, there is only, uh, you, I, I would think of that as an external scale that is introduced into the problem and, and the energy of the system uh, is uh, this, uh, this what's called the Birch parameter, which is some uh, a number of that's uh, 0 0.38 or something uh, times this external scale that is given by, by the Fermi energy. Uh -huh. So you mean this breaks scale invariance? Um, I guess it breaks scale invariance. That's true. Uh, but I mean, it, it, I, I would consider that as an external parameter that you uh, introduce to, to break this. Uh -huh. so, 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 what? so does it have conformal symmetry? Um, I think strictly it doesn't have conformal symmetry. So, so usually in the Lorentz invariant system, if I start with the Lorentz invariant system and I want to add some density to the matter fields, then it breaks Lorentz symmetry because the density is a spin one operator in Lorentz symmetry. Now, suppose I start from a fermionic system with zero density and uh, this non-relativistic conformal symmetry. Now I add some density to it. Uh, wh which part of the conformal symmetry is broken? I mean, it's not scale invariant anymore then. I, you, have, uh, you have some, if you have some density, I guess you have some interparticle distance and that, that, that introduces a scale. 
Okay, so the Galilean symmetry is not broken. Only the scale, scale, scaling symmetry is broken. Um, I think so, yes. Um, maybe one final question. So, uh, so with this non-relativistic conformal symmetry, what, how strong are the constraints? Can people do something like bootstrap? Um, what do you mean with bootstrap in this context? Say so you, in order to determine the physical properties like scaling dimensions, operator spectrum, mm -hmm. and so on, you just need to solve a bunch of equations, algebraic equations, instead of doing perturbative calculations. So you, you want to, uh, to, to cal calculate the, 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 the Green's functions of this, uh, of the field theory. Yeah. And, and uh, so some, uh, I think so, some, some, of the, some of the Green's functions uh, are, are, are very constrained. And I think they, this, this is the case if you, um, if, if you have one, uh, one free field, for example, uh, so maybe Son can co also comment on this uh, a little bit more since he has he has done calculations on that. But uh, in the the, the, the three-point function where you have uh, this um, the three-body uh, unparticle, a two-body unparticle, and uh, one free field, which is uh, one that is relevant for this problem of neutral charm mesons, uh, this. Um, you can also calculate from from very general principles. Uh, for the higher the higher order Green's functions, I think it's less restrictive. But I'm I'm also not an expert in this. I think the constraint here is uh, weaker than in the relativistic case, and I don't know anyone who has tried the bootstrap uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I, I'd like to say just one more thing. So uh, about the case with the Fermi surface, uh, although, although the Fermi momentum does introduce a length scale or momentum scale, but actually in many cases, if we zoom into the low energy regime near the Fermi surface, this scale doesn't matter. And uh, the system still has some kind of scale invariance. And the scaling is towards the Fermi surface, is not towards the origin of the momentum space. So um, I don't know if there's any still any chance to have some kind of modified non-relativistic conformal symmetry, even with the Fermi surface. So now you, you are now interested in the in excitations around the Fermi surface and, and not the yeah. close to the close to the Fermi surface, not far away. But but in that case, I think the maybe the the dimensionality of the symmetry will kind of reduce the dimension, right? For example, from two plus one goes one plus one. So I suppose maybe a three plus one d will go to something like two plus one d. Is that um, what you 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 are, you are suggesting? Uh, yeah, there will be very anisotropic scaling. So one direction in real space is uh, in momentum space is more special than the other. Yeah, just a comment. Mm, thanks. I, but I have a question about what Liu has. Uh, I, 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 I just want to understand the context. So I, I saw the system, maybe today's talk is interacting, right? So not necessarily having a free theory description like even a free Fermi on Fermi surface. So, so, uh, well, certainly we, we could still have some uh, Fermi surface description for some interacting system, but is, is it necessary a Fermi surface still a good concept for finite density Fermi on system? I, I just ask. A priori, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. But, but, but uh, there are some situation which is interacting, but there's still a good Fermi surface description. And you are asking that yeah. case, right? Yeah. Thanks. But here, unitary Fermi gas becomes super fluid, um, zero temperature. So you wouldn't have a Fermi surface. 
but is there any intermediate temperature range in which uh, some other fixed point corresponding to the Fermi surface controls the physics? Strictly speaking, no, because uh, the gap, ECS gap is of the same order of magnitude as the Fermi energy. Uh -huh. Oh, is this true only in the unitary limit or? In the unitary limit. Uh, the, oh. It's this particular example of spin one half fermion with a unitary interaction is known to have um, uh, to be superfluid with zero temperature. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Actually, because we have additional time, I wonder whether uh, Professor Hans Werner want to go through additional slides and just uh, maybe say a few words. What what are additional things you prepare to speak about? If that if that's okay. Uh, sure. So yeah, uh, I mean the so the, this whole talk was about neutrons, and um, it turns out that you can apply the same idea also to to other systems. So I mean, of course, we have the, the unitary fermions, which are usually uh, investigated with ultra cold trapped atoms and um, many, many of the properties uh, of this uh, unitary Fermi gas uh, are, are measured um, experimentally with ultra cold atoms. But um, there turns out there is a, also a system from, from Hadron physics that, that one could look at. And um, so these are uh, charmonium states that, that have been discovered at, uh, at, at Hadron uh, colliders and at B factories. So see that um, these are, um, is the spectrum uh, of, of charmonium states, which is uh, very complicated. People uh, thought they had understood this spectrum uh, from, from the quark model, but uh, with these new experiments in the last 20 years, actually uh, many new states have been found. And one of these states is particularly interesting. This is called uh, this X3872, which is a little bit unusual. It has many properties that are difficult to understand if it's an ordinary CC state. Uh, and uh, there are still ongoing discussions of what this state is, but one um, viable interpretation is that uh, it's a molecule uh, of so-called D mesons. And, and D mesons, uh, this is like the analog of a pion, uh, but where one light quark is replaced by a charm quark. And uh, two of these D mesons, uh, D star, are vector mesons with spin one, uh, and the other ones are just regular D mesons. And it turns out that this uh, X3872 is extremely close uh, to the threshold uh, of these uh, two neutron D two neutral D mesons, and that uh, has led uh, to the interpretation of the state uh, as a molecule of D mesons. So it's not some kind of compact quark state. This is the assumption. Uh, tetra quarks would be a, a more compact state, but it's a it's a, a bound state of D mesons, a molecule. Uh, and if you take um, this assumption, uh, you can derive certain properties of the interaction of this X with other D mesons and so on. And essentially you can describe it by the same uh, effective theory that, that uh, I used in, in the talk before. So um, assume this is a weakly bound molecule of D mesons with a particular wave function that uh, is constructed so that it has even C parity because this is what uh, is measured. And you if you look at the binding energy of this molecule relative to the threshold that is given by these D, uh, mesons, uh, 0 0.07. So this now also results in a very large scattering length, but the scattering length in contrast to neutrons is positive because this is a bound state. In the neutron case, it was negative. It was a virtual state, but the two neutrons are not bound. And then um, you can use uh, 
the same uh, methods that I discussed uh, to also derive universal properties. So Eric Braten um, has written a, a number of papers on that, for example. And uh, in this model, you can also explain some of the peculiarities of this X3872. Uh, but uh, it turns out that um, this also, this system has this approximate conformal symmetry. Uh, the D mesons are bosons. So we don't, we don't have the fermions, but uh, so in principle, you would assume that there is some kind of epimorph effect. But if you look at the system and, and look at uh, the, the coefficient of the one over R squared potential, uh, that I discussed previously, you find that it's below the critical coupling. So even though it's bosons, it behaves like uh, it behaves like neutrons, and it has this conformal symmetry. However, uh, it's a little bit different from the neutron case because now there is a different channel. You have scattering channels, but you also have a bound state channel, and then uh, you could discuss approximate. The uh, unparticles of neutral charm mesons. There are these uh, uh, unparticles of 3D mesons. So this is kind of the what we discussed before. Uh, but you could also have uh, in the three particle channel here an unparticle of the bound state uh, and the third D meson. Uh, and so for these uh, two. Uh, in principle, uh, the, the same applies that I discussed this, uh, before, but here, uh, let's take a look at this XD scattering uh, or point production of an XD, again, in a short range reaction. There are also some predictions that you get, uh, and this is shown here. So this- uh, Excuse me, may I make sure what you mean by different line shapes in the decay channel? What's the line shapes you mean? Um, so, Let's let me maybe go back. So if you have, if you look at a, so you, you measure some kind of energy distribution like this, and so here, uh, if you have a peak like that in the spectrum, uh, they, then uh, you would usually interpret that as some particle or some resonance. Uh, so the center of that, say, is the mass, but there is some kind of width, uh, and here. This uh, so this can have uh, like a different behavior, right? So in you can have Lorentzian line, uh, line shapes, or you can have a, a bright Wigner, and that of course depends on the on the underlying interactions you have. So it, it's not a it's not a sharp state, but it's a state that has some kind of width, and the form of this uh, peak in the spectrum. Um, that, uh, that, that is called the line shape. I think the, the name is from atomic physics where you have no line of the... Um... But because the distribution might look quite different. So it, the mass is kind of a, a, this uh, inverse proportional to the, 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 the width of the broadening. Um, the mass is not inversely proportional to the width. I mean, that... that uh, could be the case for, for a particular line shape, but you would, I mean, naively you would say the mass is no where the maximum is, and then you could take the width at the full, full width that have maximum or something like this. This would be one, one way of, of doing this. But uh, of course, um, in what I say here, when I say the, the, the mass, uh, deep, um, yeah, so I said the, the measured mass depends on the decay channel. So this, this uh, happened because people just naively analyzed the data, but they didn't take into account, into account that the line shape in these different channels actually has a different form. And if you take into account that there are different interactions in these channels and uh, take the correct line shape, then of course you will get the same mass if it's the same particle. Okay. So it was an artifact of doing the analysis uh, in a way that's not sophisticated enough, I would say. Okay. No problem. I'm just, I think the, the origin uh, motivation for that question was just line shape can be much more complicated than the single uh, label of, of, of mass, right? So there, there could be very complicated uh, 
line shapes. So, so it's, I, I was asking just for why just mention a, a mass. Like yeah, the line shape can be more complicated, mass. but you would say the if you, if you have a particle or a resonance, then um, I mean this this would be specified by some pole in the compact in the complex plane of the of the scattering matrix, and this is uh, specified by two numbers, a mass and a width. So real and imaginary part. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so you look at the system like that. So here, um, this um, if you is one prediction for unparticles of three neutral charm mesons, and this is the, the point production of an XD pair. And uh, as I discussed before in this case um, the, the form of this uh, three-point function where uh, you have um, the one a free particle that has scaling dimension uh, three halves you have uh, this x which is a, a dimer field this has scaling dimension two and then you have uh, of course this uh, three-body unparticle, which has scaling dimension delta three, you, you can show that uh, the three-point function uh, has a certain uh, scaling behavior with the energy. You know, if you want to calculate the point production, you take this three-point function squared. So this is what is in these parentheses. Uh, and you have to multiply with the phase space factor, phase space uh, is square root of E. And if you put in all the numbers here, so delta one three halves is the free particle, you have the dimer, and then you have uh, the complex, uh, the, the, the fractional scaling dimension for this uh, three body unparticle. And so there are two numbers here, depends a little bit uh, on whether this D is a D or a D star meson. So this is what gives you these numbers, but you see there, uh, pretty close together. And if you just take 3.1, uh, you find that the scaling behavior of this production cross section with energy uh, is e to the 0 0.1. Uh, once you're above the energy scale set by the scattering length. And this is uh, dimensionless units here. So this is one. So this is the scaling region. This is where, well, this is determined by conformal symmetry. Down here, of course, this is uh, infrared physics of this particular system. So this um, uh, this is not determined by um, conformal symmetry, but of course you can calculate that in some effective field theory. Uh, and if you go to higher energies here, um, then of course a short distance effects will uh, set in. But here, this scaling, this is the scaling that comes from conformal symmetry. Uh, and this would be something that, uh, for example, could be measured um, at the LHC. And on the right-hand side is a similar plot for the elastic scattering cross-section. Uh, in this case, uh, we have calculated, uh, there is also a scaling region, and we have calculated the scaling exponent numerically by, by solving integral equations, but we have not been able uh, to derive this uh, from conformal symmetry. Okay, so that, that's um, what I wanted to say about this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hans and uh, Heimer for the uh, great seminars. Uh, any more questions? If there is any. So in any case, uh, let's let us thank a uh, uh, professor again. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks.